Hello Team FD and welcome back to Winners and Losers, the show where we look at the highs and the lows from the world of football in the weekend just gone. It's normally Premier League football we report on, isn't it? But it was internationalduty.com this weekend, so we're going to two-foot some national team news. Joining me as ever is Joseph Tomlinson. And before we delve in, how the devil was your weekend, good sir? Do you know what? It was actually good. It was actually good. I was off playing a bit of golf down in Surrey. I lost so many balls. It's untold. I'm not the best golfer. I'm okay. I'm not too bad. But 16 of the 18 holes had water hazards. I've never seen anything like it. Got me needing me scuba gear by about hole 17. It was awful. Uh, lovely course, though. How was yours? I was actually recovering from a midweek wedding. Wedding season is upon us again. I disgraced myself, got very drunk, and spent the subsequent 72 hours in a hole. Two-day hangovers are here. The dawn, the age of the two-day hangover is here for me, no longer in my early 20s or even mid-20s at this point. So just a pathetic mess. And speaking of pathetic messes, Joe, we're kicking things off with Brazil versus Argentina. What on earth? happened last night because it's been a crazy 12 hours of reporting hasn't it what a segue that was by the way hamster yeah i mean what a shit show in brazil if you guys haven't seen the scenes between brazil and argentina of officials entering play and trying to remove players overnight then what on earth have you been looking at brazil in a total meltdown right now. Of course, let's not forget, it was only a couple of months ago they were hosting the Copa America, much to people's surprise as well. And this all stems from the fact that four Argentinian players, that's Emi Martinez, Christian Romero, Emi Buendia, and Giovanni Lo Celso, are all alleged to have lied about the fact they had been in the UK within 14 days before entering Brazil. Apparently, they missed it out when filling in the list, or somebody that filled in the list for them might well have missed it out. And obviously, we're on Brazil's red list. Brazil is on our red list. So you can't really travel between those two countries. And when the Brazilian authorities, that's Anvisa, a department of Brazil's health ministry, discovered this, they obviously weren't too pleased. So they apparently went to the team hotel, couldn't find any of the players there. They tried to get to the stadium, got stuck in traffic. By the time they got to the stadium, the game had already started. So they had to come onto the pitch which led to scenes like this. Yes, so as you can see, Anvisa not exactly greeted in a merry fashion once they'd negotiated Sao Paulo's infamous traffic. The Argentina team eventually walk off the pitch, wait in the dressing room, apparently refusing access to the players in question. Uh, Argentina's FA then announced shortly after that the match is officially suspended. It's off. At which point Lionel Messi says, why did they start the game and stop it after five minutes? We've been at the stadium for an hour. But as Joe has just detailed, he's just broken down. And Visa were behind the team, behind proceedings. And I think they were unaware that there had been various agreements for the game to go on outside of the health authorities. I mean, and Visa, it sounds like they're just trying to do their job. They're just trying to enforce whatever COVID protocols have been put in place. But as is in South America, uh, football um, took the centre stage, didn't it? And a lot of people wanted this famous fixture to happen despite people not adhering to health and safety. Now, uh, Brazilian TV actually said the changing rooms were locked before the game as well. So even if Anvisa officials had arrived, they weren't accessible. Uh, welcome to the mess that we're trying to detail right now. Um, I mean, I think AFA officials took to live television shortly after the incident, uh, denying that the four players in question lied about being in, in England within the two weeks. But again, like Joe said before, a grey area there. They might have just missed certain parts of, of certain documents out. Uh, and I think it ended with the Albi Celeste flying back to Buenos Aires with a full squad. Although, um, I do think that the Aston Villa boys are on their way back to their club now. And it has since been reported this morning that the Tottenham boys might face a fine from their club. <laughs> Brazil ended up doing an open training session on the pitch as to not waste you know, everyone's time and entertain some of the fans that had showed up for the game. And a correspondent on TNS Sports um, who I'm not familiar with, uh, but he reported this morning that had the shoe been on the other foot, had this been like Brazilian players entering the UK without quarantining uh, appropriately beforehand or following rules and regs, uh, they could have faced up to 10 years in prison. I mean, that is the maximum term, isn't it? What? This is sensationalizing it. And a fine <laughs> of £10,000. So I feel like 
it's, it's quite serious. It's being played down. I think um, Scaloni and Co., who's the Argentina manager, was waiting for a waiver. I think waivers were handed out left, right and centre by the Brazilian government during the Copper America, weren't they? Uh, <laughs> and now there's, there's a triple header in October that they really need to sort this mess out in time for because I don't think anyone knows where they stand when it comes to, you know, playing these World Cup qualifiers in Brazil. So let's hope it's all cleared up by then. But it is an absolute state. I mean, Brazil were without nine players ahead of this fixture. Um, so maybe Argentina should have erred on the side of caution. However, they are, what, six points behind Brazil in qualification. So maybe they just thought, let's take our best players and throw caution to the wind. It's not worked out. It has not worked out at all. I mean, guys, if we've missed out any details, if any new details have emerged, get conversing in the comments below. Let's move on to something a little bit more cut and dry. Let's move on to our winners, our losers, and our moment of the week. Moving on to our winners, and we're actually going for Real Madrid's aging stars here, because a couple of their players had very good weekends in the form of Gareth Bale and Eden Hazard. Let's start with Gareth Bale, of course. He scored a hat-trick against, admittedly, you know, it was against Belarus, but Wales came from 2-1 down to win 3-2. And boy, did they need their talisman. They should probably and could probably have been 4-1 down at half time. Two of Bale's goals were penalties, so let's put a bit of context behind it, but he's certainly refining a little bit of form slowly, mm. which is definitely going to please Carlo Ancelotti towards the back end of last season at Tottenham Hotspur. He looked like he was refining a little bit of that old Gareth Bale magic. He's now eight goals clear of Ian Rush's country record, of course, as top goal scorer for Wales, and he has started Real Madrid's first three league games under Carlo Ancelotti, scoring one goal. He hasn't lasted longer than 70 minutes in any of those games, though, so mm. he does need to get back up to that fitness. But we know Carlo rates Bale extremely highly. We've heard him talk in this preseason about needing to get Bale back to full flight, needing to get Hazard back to full flight, and I think it might be possible. I don't think we're going to see the glory days of Bale, but I'm expecting a much improved season from one a couple of seasons ago where he was falling asleep on the bench, Hamill. And I'm expecting <laughs> a similar sort of thing from Eden Hazard too. Yeah, at this point, I think Ancelotti will be pleased to see the pair of them just get a meaningful amount of minutes, right? It's been a long time since I've seen Gareth Bale go 92, 93 minutes as he did in the Belarus game at club level and have a big impact at the end of the fixture. Uh, Eden Hazard didn't have a tough time uh, of it against the Czech Republic with Belgium prevailing as 3-0 victors but he was very impressive indeed scored his first goal for the Red Devils since November 2019 he also completed a match high amount of dribbles laid on seven chances so it was pretty unfortunate not to get an assist that was four more than anyone else to provide some context so it wasn't just the fact he got a goal under the hood his numbers starting to look like the Eden Hazard of old. Of course, his his start of the season has been a little bit more patchy than Bale's. Of course, only lasted 12 minutes against Real Batista. Say last that he was brought on, wasn't he? Vinicius Jr. was given the nod after his, his antics in the match before, or heroics, I should say. Um, but yeah, Eden Hazard, let's hope he can get fit and firing very soon. This round of international games has been good for him. Um, I also want to shout out Romelu Lukaku, who netted his 67th goal in his 100th cap for Belgium in this game too. And he's now bagged a frightening 50 goals in his last 50 appearances at international level. It is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Uh, talking of disgusting, we're going to move on to our losers right now, which is uh, FIFA not banning the hungry fans. Yeah, this was absolutely disgusting. Now, we, of course, all expected England to hammer Hungary and Andorra, and they did, rightly so. But, I mean, Hungary are no mugs on the pitch. You know, they've taken a couple of points for France and Germany in recent games. Off the pitch, though, absolute mugs of course racially abusing some of the England players during that game now prior to this fixture the nation had already seen a three-match ban imposed on them by UEFA 
for discriminatory behavior. However, this game sat under FIFA's jurisdiction, so fans were allowed inside mm. the stadium. Raheem Sterling obviously targeted after scoring England's opening goal. Jude Bellingham, only 18, also targeted as well. Absolutely vile at the Puskas Arena. FIFA have since opened disciplinary proceedings. I mean, this is just totally, totally unacceptable. Let's hear what Gareth Southgate had to say on the matter. It sounds like there have been some uh some incidents and everybody knows what we stand for as a team and that that's completely unacceptable so um yeah i, I think everything is being reported to uefa um and uh, we have to see what happens from there safe to say that anti-discrimination bodies like kick it out show racism the red card and fair were not happy with uefa and fifa after the game and rightly so how that ban wasn't just transferred over seamlessly from one body to another beyond common sense really uh, the professional football association also weighing in said that these loopholes had to be addressed when a ban is dished out fans have got to be punished adequately or no lessons are learned so this game should have been played behind closed doors like i said if common sense had prevailed now the hungarian football federation which is the mlsz said that those who disrupted the match need to be identified and severely punished but they didn't make any specific reference to any discriminatory behavior so it feels like they've tried to gloss over that one which of course shouldn't happen and the whole footballing community should hold them to account for it. Now on a slightly happier note and not to dilute the issue in hand, but it was great to see uh, that this didn't affect the England cap camp in the next fixture. Of course, Bakaya Saka scoring on his birthday, receiving a rapturous applause for it. I think he is the most popular player in an England shirt right now. Nothing but goodwill sent his way. Jesse Lingard uh, grabbing a double and an assist while Harry Kane notching up his 40th in just 63 appearances against Andorra. That is all against Andorra. Harry Kane has not played against Andorra 63 times. That would be a farce, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, yeah, let's have a listen to that round of uh, happy birthday for Saka because it was quite touching in the post-match interview, wasn't it? Not a bad birthday present, scoring a goal for your country. How's it feel? <laughs> and there goes the crowd. Thank you. <laughs> There could only be one moment of the week this week, and that was the Afghan women's national team being safely evacuated to Australia. It was doing the rounds on Twitter. Extremely heartwarming. Um, if you want further context on the story, check out my timeline, because I have retweeted uh, several tweets from the people involved in getting them to Australia. Joseph, that is the end of the show. Have we got anything specific to plug on Football Daily. Yeah, why not come and watch Sunday Vibes if you haven't already. Us talking about the biggest winners and the biggest losers from the transfer window just gone. Obviously, I was talking heavily about Manchester United signing Cristiano Ronaldo, who just in happened to become the top international goal scorer of all time last week, Hamill. There we have it. All right, like, subscribe to the channel with notifications on, and we'll catch you in next week's Winners and Losers. Goodbye.